talk about saving souls, my guest today is in the business of saving lives, not just one or two, but more than 30,000. But what has his own life been like? Well, here to tell you about it is India's leading heart surgeon, Naresh Trihan. Welcome to the program, Naresh. Thank you. Now, with both your parents doctors, your father an ENT specialist and your mother a gynecologist, was it inevitable that you would be a doctor? I don't know. Now that I look back, it seems like that it did leave some inscriptions on my mind that their life, the way they were practicing medicine, treating patients, the fact that people would come in in pain and, and almost very uncomfortable and leave smiling, that I'm sure left an impression. Uh, I never thought my, that I would become at that stage because my father always discouraged me from, from becoming a doctor saying that the kind of hours that one has to put in, uh, it, it takes away a lot from life. But I don't know, as, as we went along, the more he said and, and my parents discouraged me and this was a done thing, I, in my mind that if the, the more they tell you not to do it, you should do it. So I think a combination of the do, two maybe steered me in this direction. Let's go back to your childhood. You lived in a small flat in the center of Delhi, which you shared more often than not with many of your father's patients. What sort of childhood was it? This is right after the partition, because I was one year old, and then when, when then he got uh, started practicing in Connaught Place. This was a three-room flat. My mother used to practice in one, him in the other, and my sister, my parents, and myself, four of us used to live in one room. So there was always this interaction with patients coming in uh, and uh, listening to you know different different aspects of it. So my, uh, my recollection of it is, you know, that it was cramped, we were all, but it also was togetherness. And also my exposure to different aspects, like, <coughs> excuse me, that there would be people who didn't have any money, because a lot of people had been displaced from Pakistan like us. And they would come and get treated by my father, and didn't have any money, so he wouldn't charge them anything. But a few days later, a few, few weeks later, somebody would come with a pair of shoes for him, you know, even for the children. This is the famous cobbler your father used to Right, exactly. So, and then there was a cook from Chemsor Club who used to bring specially made chicken, you know, just that whole interaction and gratitude which people expressed for the relief they got from their disease, no matter, you know, and the fact that they, nobody even charged them. I think all these things put together must have left, uh, left a kind of a, uh, a, a deep impression on me to say, you know, what kind of interaction you have with people. But side by side with the deep impression that human nature left on you, you were also quite a willful child. I'm told that you weren't above naughtiness. <laughs> Is it true that you kidnapped the headmaster's dog in school? Yeah, that's true. I mean, that's one of many things we used to do. Uh, but our principal, <coughs> Mr. M. N. Kapoor, what a great guy he was, actually a great, great teacher. But he has his two, he had his two pet dogs, uh, Alsatians, whom we used to call the early warning system. <laughs> So they used to arrive before he used to come so that we could straighten ourselves out by uh, no matter what we were doing. But one day we decided that we were going to handicap him with his, with his dog. So we, they arrived and he, it was a little, he, we couldn't see him so we locked them up in the school, classroom and then all of us disappeared. So he was in a panic because they were his actual companions day and night. So I mean we got into a little bit of trouble but there was, that, was, that was daily routine. I mean, but quite healthy stuff. It's not, not something which Your which friends say off. that Naresh always looked for opportunities to get out of school and that's why he really took up aero modeling. No, no. Get out of school legally. The point was to do things and not get into trouble. So I was the president of the aero modeling club and we had these uh, free, free flying aircrafts. So we used to point them in the direction of Bengali market and <laughs> let them fly. So we had to go retrieve school property and in the way came Bengali market, Nathu Sweet. So you and became a great chart. patron, did you? <laughs> <laughs> right, it was great fun. Now, <coughs> in those days, mm. you were in fact a left-hander, but you've now become quite ambidextrous. So what was it that made you use your right hand? You know, I was, I guess I was born left-handed, <coughs> and I used, to, I used to write quite nicely with my left hand, but then I had a Hindi tutor at home who decided the left hand was unlucky. I, I suppose in those days they believed that. So he used to break my knuckles with, with pencils and say, move to the right hand. You mean literally break your knuckles? Yeah, I mean make painful pressure and stuff like that. And he successfully converted me to the right hand, but my, my handwriting went to pot. And I used to actually resent him, curse him, you know, that he really gave me a handicap for life. Till I became a surgeon. When I arrived in New York and I started operating, and I realized that I could use both my hands equally well. 
and that gave me a great advantage because surgeons when they had to put back stitches they used to have to bend themselves backwards and always struggling to put the right stitch and you I just, just used the other hand? hands and go which was which was a great gift actually so when I came back w visiting India one I went and saw him and actually thanked him with some <laughs> sweets and stuff like that and I said thank you in fact when you took up medicine you decided to do so at the King George's Medical <coughs> College in Lucknow was that a big change after modern school, Delhi? Oh, God, it was a cultural shock, <laughs> I think, of greatest magnitude. Because, you know, you live in a kind of a dream world in, in Delhi. You know, your friends, school, parents, and everything is comfortable. Uh, there, there was no question of, you know, where somebody comes from and what their caste and creed is. The moment I arrived in Lucknow, the first thing, one of the questions I was asked is, what caste are you? I said, I'm, I'm a Punjabi. He said, stop fooling around. What caste are you? I said, what is a caste? That's when the first time I got at the age of 17, I think I, I actually understood that there is a caste and a, some whatever, whatever, how it goes. And um, I said, yeah, I don't know. But there was a whole cultural difference between, between the way people thought, the way people, the intrigue. I think it was, a, it, on one hand it was a cultural shock, but I think it was a great growing up experience because that has helped me to handle situations much better because you you understand how people think. I mean, they, there is a very little connection with what they say and what they actually are thinking. So there are, you know, you, you can sift people out now and say, you know, what, what is actually... You understand people meaning. better. Definitely, definitely. And they were like, you know, it was different kind of, there were gangs and they were like at each other's throats and stuff like that. Fortunately, I, I was able to tear through that. Where I was, they asked me, they said, Aap, you are a man from center. I said, what is center? <laughs> so it's a whole culture. I mean, it's a it's a culture which is totally alien to what you would normally normally encounter living in Delhi. Funny thing is, you went straight from Lucknow to New York, and you ended up studying under the legendary Frank Spencer, who you considered your guru. Do you remember how you first met him? Yeah, you no. Know, when I went, I went. There were two things in my mind. One, that I'd come back to India. The reason of going overseas would be to to acquire, suck in all the knowledge I could from the West and come back and apply it in India. So this was like a nascent thought in my mind already. And the second was, I went with an open mind to see what specialty, what are the frontiers of medicine that are developing because living in India, especially in Lucknow, one was totally isolated from the, from the medical world outside, I mean, where science was going. So when I arrived there, in my first rotation, I realized that heart surgery was what I really wanted to do. So you didn't actually set out to be a heart surgeon. It all happened at when that you got time. There. I, w I could have easily been a neurosurgeon. I knew I wanted to be a surgeon because I wanted to. I like to work with my hands, and I, I was always fiddling with things, making mechanos and pulling apart watches and trying to put them together. That was always in my nature, aero modeling. So background-wise, when I look at it, <coughs> I was, you know, always inclined. My 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 talent was in in fixing things. So when I realized that, you know, and I can't sit in front of a computer or a, or a chart and read for two hours and write things, so I, I, I found heart surgery to be the most suited for me. You take somebody very sick, they're dying, you operate on them, fix them, and they walk out seven, eight, ten days later. So tell me, how then did you find Frank Spencer? Where did you run across him? So when I first decided that this would be the specialty, I, I asked around who's the best teacher of heart surgery, and, you know, uh, unanimously the re reply came, Frank Spencer, but forget him because his, he's got a waiting list of five years and he, as a foreigner, you don't stand a chance getting into his program. <coughs> sure enough, that was the other challenge. I wrote to him, explaining everything, why I'd come to the U.S., what I wanted to do, go back to India, you know. And it was, it, it was actually quite, quite interesting because when I had to go see him, then he wrote back and said, come for an interview. And I used to, my hair was down to to my shoulders, I had a bucket handle moustache, the sideburns. You were a hippie. There were, I was to be. I wasn't a real hippie, but that was the hippie. But the closest time. thing yes. you could be. No, no, I was. I was uh, part of the times. So I arrived there, and I, he, he must have looked at me up and down, and said, "Where does this animal arrive from?" <laughs> but fortunately, the questions he asked me, I knew the answers. Like I could rattle them off because of some, some special disease he asked me about, and I knew everything about it. So it was luck, a little bit of luck. And he said to me, he says, you know, you're the only doctor I've met who knows more about this disease than I do. So, anyway, so there were 300 applicants for that one job. So we still didn't know whether I'd go, I was going to get it. But while, you know, while sitting there waiting for him uh, to, uh, because he left a huge impression on my mind. I mean, this was a man who would 
turn your life. I mean, that was a turn, major turning point in my life. So the more you saw him, the more determined you were, you were going to study. <clears throat> no, no, you, you know, I was working in another hospital, Thomas Jefferson University, and I could see how people reacted about sick people, whether somebody died, they said, oh, you did your best, don't, don't worry. This man, you, this, the, the incidents I want to relate is, at a morbidity and mortality conference, he was, he, people used to present their cases to him, the, the residents. And there was a 70-year-old black lady who came for a gallbladder operation in an emergency. The, the surgeon successfully operated on her, but not that same night, but the next morning. And he asked a simple question. He said, if this was your grandmother, would you wait till the next morning because she could have died at night? I mean, okay, she did all right, does not make it right. So that left a huge, huge impression on me that, you know, look at this man. Here's a destitute lady who, who had no money, nothing. And he, he cared so much that how well she was treated, which was total contrast with the, uh, with, uh, with the other people who I had been in contact with. So I was immediately sort of obsessed with that. If I'm going to train, this is the man I would like to train with. And when you got that job, you were the only successful applicant out of 300 for one single vacancy. Was it for you a complete turning point? No, it was, I, I couldn't believe it. I used to call Dr. Spencer's secretary every day, every morning. He says, honey. Because I would kind of started talking to her while I was waiting for him and she kind of became friendly. And I would say, her name was Honey. So I said, Honey, am I, what's happening? She said, you made it to 150, you made it to 75, you made it. So one fine morning she tells me, he says, he signed your contract last night. I am just mailing it to you. I was in Philadelphia. I said, wait, don't mail it. I am coming right now. So I drove all the way, signed the contract. Because I didn't want to take a chance that it got lost in the mail. I was totally determined that I was going to train You aren't taking any chances with it? Not with this one. No, no. The Never. amazing thing is you joined him. You became one of the best known surgeons at the New York University Medical Center. And yet, a little bit down the road, you threw it all up to come back to India. Why? No, I didn't throw it all up. I, as I told you, that in the back of my mind, this, I'm a, I'm a fatalist Indian. I mean, nationalist, I should say. I believe, and maybe I'm right or wrong, that we do possess one of the finest brains in the world. We have been blessed by it, uh, with it. But unfortunately, we have not channelized it most of the time in the right direction. So I always, I, you know, I trained there, then I joined the faculty, and I used to train heart surgeons, research, all this stuff I was doing on a daily basis. And I felt, you know, every year, over 100 patients used to come from India to New York for me to operate on them from New York. So you felt you had to do to it New in York, India. yeah. So I felt that if they have, and each one of them had the, had the same thing on their lips. Why do we have to come, risk our lives, spend 10 times the money coming here? Why can't you do it in India? So this whole reminder was there every day, and I felt that we could do it because our, our people would be, would be equally good or better than what I have in New York. It became a mission, in a sense, to go back and fulfill in India what you were doing in America so successfully. I had a point to prove. I had a point to prove, and, and the point was, that we can do it as well or better, and I'm happy to say, yes, I feel that we, have, we can do it better. Now, let's just take a break. I want part two to come back and talk about exactly how you actually proved the point, not just to yourself, but to the whole of the country. We'll be back in just a couple of moments. Stick with us. Welcome back. My guest is India's leading heart surgeon, Naresh Tehan. Naresh, let's talk a bit about the life you built in India after you returned in 1988. Today, you're someone that people want to emulate. But how difficult were those early years? You know, there is one, one clear point that comes through. There is no shortcut to, to doing anything properly and successfully. Uh, from the point we started to come back, to decided to come back, I mean, there have been many hurdles, but there were also, there was intervention from somewhere or the other that saved the project. So from, from Mrs. Gandhi to Rajiv Gandhi to bureaucrats to, it's always been a positive experience. So I can, you know, contrary to what other people believe, I think that if you stick with somebody, something long enough and you believe in it that you can do it, it happens. So you're also this saying that for every obstacle, there was a helping hand as well. Absolutely, absolutely, and help came from every direction, which was, which was a great experience. I mean, I can, I can speak w about it with, with great uh, uh, conviction that, you know, just because people felt that I was sincere, what helped me was that they knew I had a huge successful practice in, in, in New York. They knew I, had a, I was a professor at New York University. 
they also knew that there was no reason for me to come back except for something maybe that I want to do. So, those things, the credentialing of my sincerity was always helpful, I would say. And then also there was a huge void in India. I mean, there was the quality of care which we wanted to bring in one stroke, bring India to, to international levels. So, I, I think everything helped. To, and uh, to yet, put it together. you were an NRI, you'd never handled Indian red tape before, you'd never come face to face with the bureaucracy. Was there ever a moment when you said to yourself, I'm probably making a mistake, maybe I should just give up and go back? It could happen any given day. You know, one of the things people say, you know, you, I'll, I'll tell you two, two things. One, people used to say, okay, you want to go to India, but don't burn your bridges because you may have to come back. And I actually deliberately burnt all my bridges because you say, if you have this option of jumping back every time you, you face some difficulty, that's not a way to do things. So, that was one, the determination to do it. Second was people said, we're not going to give you a farewell because we know you're going to come back. So, I said, fine enough, spares me some time. But here we are and I, and, and I can say it with great fondness and I, I encourage people to do this also, but only one belief that if you don't say, should I go back to India? You say, if I want, if I determined to go back to India, nothing can stop you. I mean, I, and there is plenty of opportunity, there is plenty of help available, provided that that stream comes through, the committedness comes through clearly. It's come through in a big way in your case. As I said earlier, you perhaps saved more than 30,000 lives in the time you've been back. What does being a doctor mean to you? You know, when I first started here, because I assembled a full team, and I'm proud to say that they have performed better than the Americans would have if they were given this situation, that my only message to them was that I'd read about the Chipko movement, the, where they used to hang on to trees so that they won't get cut. And I used to say, our stream of medicine is going to be, you Chipko to your patient, and don't let him slip out of your hand. So treat every patient like he's your relative or your parent. And that's the best medicine you can deliver because that takes away all the other extraneous factors that may come in anybody's mind or functioning or you, you have a family function or go to sleep or whatever. If it's your relative, you'll be there and you must give in that extra 10% to make it successful. So as a heart surgeon, when you finished an operation knowing that you've just saved someone's life, is it still a thrill or is it now just a big relief? No, I, I think thrill definitely is there, but a relief also because you take the responsibility of somebody's lives. So, you know, it's like, it's like I, I make it, it, make it like uh, a flight. You actually take off, you're doing what you're and you've got to land them safely. And when you do that, you do feel a sense of relief and also, also thrill that you successfully could able to do it. So the more challenging the case, yes, the greater the thrill. And this is the real reward of a doctor? I think it's a combination of one the very fact that you ha you are one to one with with a human being in their lives second is the fact that you know people interact with you in a different way which is which is a great satisfaction because they look at you differently if you behave if you behave yourself and i think i, I think that whole interaction is is very rewarding let's talk a bit about the personal side of your life in 1963 you met the lady that you married madhu you were 16 17 at the time do you remember that first meeting yeah, very definitely. I do remember that meeting, and it was it was a major turning point in my life, because we were I was at a party like any teenager was, and I saw her walk in, and I th it was basically at first sight. So I saw her, and I, I I was actually about to go and pick up my other girlfriend, my my girlfriend actually at that time, who was uh, who was a Iranian girl. And I was with a friend, so I said to him, I said, I must go talk to my, my, my girlfriend, but please keep an eye on, on this girl. I'm just coming back. Please don't let her, anybody dance with her and things like that. So this friend was true enough. He kept her occupied while I was gone. And I went and told my girlfriend, look, I, I couldn't do it. I've got to take my mother somewhere or something like that. <laughs> that was <coughs> Madhu says that fact, back. you used to love dancing and you were constantly leaving the floor. Was it the Iranian girl you were ringing to reassure? See, suddenly something happens to you in life where you have another life going on already, I mean, in multiple forms. Naturally, you, you got to extricate yourself, but it was, it was basically, I mean, you, you get, I got struck. I mean, that, that feeling. She swept you off your feet. 
you can say that because if you ever ask me, we used to say, I'm not getting married till 30, I'm not going to even go steady till 25, you know, that kind of stuff. I you mean, didn't even days. wait till 25, you were 23 when you got married. Not only that, we, I started going out with her when we were, I was 17, so you can imagine, I mean, all everything got short-circuited. <laughs> but that's great. I mean, I look at it uh, in hindsight as a great thing to have happened. I'm Looking lucky. back today, when you've had Madhu beside you, and now you have two children, have you been a good father or do you think your commitment to your profession has sometimes come in the way? Most definitely, I've, I, I and the family have paid a price for it, no question about that. And I am that much grateful to them for, ha for hanging in there because there are times when it was very difficult. There was for seven years, I was on call every other day, every other weekend, and I used to come home maybe 11 o'clock at night and leave at 6 in the morning on the nights that I was off. So you never really saw so the seven, children Yeah, but yeah, you were to every other weekend you maybe spent half a day because, but you were half a person because you were so, uh, so exhausted and deprived of sleep that you had to catch up all these things. So I think that we have paid that price, but I've tried to make up from the point that I feel, I've always wanted it. I mean, I've enjoyed children and everything. And I think in the last five, seven years, I've been able to, to be a good father, I think, and a good husband and a good family man. Your friends say that Naresh likes helping people and he doesn't hesitate to ask for help in return. Is that the real description? I think, I think you know, I, I, I'm not a person who stands on formality. I think when, if somebody asks me for help, they shouldn't say, you're sorry to bother you because I, if I can help somebody, that's a great pleasure. And I also want to encourage interpersonal relationships. So I, uh, I don't hesitate to ask somebody, you know, if, if, if I need help. What's wrong with it? Why do people get frozen from each other? Your critics say that he parties too much, he's a social animal. Well, I do go out, I do party, but in good proportion. Uh, somebody said to me, you know, we saw you, uh, you were out, to the, you, you were partying till three. I said, were you there? <laughs> what were you doing till three o'clock? He said, no, no, I, w I wasn't there. I thought, I thought, two parts. One, I don't drink. I may, maximum I'll drink is one drink. So that that helps because people who are wasting their lives drinking is actually, that's why they have trouble getting up in the morning. I sleep five hours, I used to, now I sleep six hours, six hours as I'm getting older because that's what my body needs. So I'm in bed by, I calculate from the time I have to go to work, I must be in bed so that I get good six hours of sleep. You've had so, a lot of recognition in your life. You've got the Padma Bhushan last week, you got a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Health Minister. What does this recognition mean? You know, it, in one way, it means a lot of, in the sense that if your peers recognize you for your work, it always feels good, no question. Does it make any difference otherwise in your work or your dedication or anything? It, it bucks you along. It, it's encouragement. But otherwise, it's, it's, not, it's not really a material difference in your, the way you the way you'd want to change your life. Rishan, it's been a pleasure having you on the program. Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you. Thanks very much.